The Tumma Water. June 13th, 1979. In a scorching and burning world, we cannot survive without the Tumma teaching, which is similar to water that puts out fire. Without the Sasana, or Buddhism, the world would be similar to that of a village or a forest that is being consumed by fire with no water to put it out. There can only be destruction. In a place where there is enough water to put out the fire, that place will be safe and secure. In a place where there is not enough water, that place will be left in a total state of devastation. This is similar to the hearts of people living in this world which need the teaching, the Tamma water, to quench the fires of Raga, Dosa, and Moha, lust, hate, and delusion. If we cannot use the Tamma to totally extinguish this fire, at least we should try to diminish it. This is like an illness which needs the proper medicine to cure it. In sickness, some may die, and some may be cured and live. It depends on the ability of the doctor, whether the disease can be cured or not. If he cannot do it, then the patient will die. If he can, then the patient will survive. It is the same way with our hearts. If we have the tumma water, we can then extinguish the fire inside our hearts. If our hearts are cruel and malicious, and we pay no attention to good and bad, right and wrong, heaven and hell, but only the things that we desire, then our hearts will be on fire. No matter how much we can acquire with our desires, if the heart is constantly burning and the tumma water cannot reach it, then the heart will always be ablaze. There will be more greed if we allow ourselves to pursue our greed, our ragatangha, our lust. We cannot curb our greed by constantly pursuing it through delusion, not paying any attention to right and wrong, but allowing ourselves to be led astray by the influence of the Kilesas, Dangha, and Dasava. Our hearts will then be on fire. Wherever we live, be it in a palace or a mansion, our hearts will always be consumed by fire, because there is no water to put it out. This water is the Tamma. So for this reason, the Tamma is absolutely essential for all sentient beings, similar to water that is essential for putting out fire. As soon as the sasana or Buddhism disappears from the world, then the world will be set ablaze. All sentient beings that live in the world will all be scorched by fire. There will not be any happiness. That is why all the sages like the Lord Buddha have to teach the Tamma to enlighten people's hearts. Therefore, the importance of the Tamma is foremost, and nothing can surpass it. Our body and speech are the servants, while our hearts are the master. Body and speech obey the commands of the heart. Therefore the heart is paramount. According to the Tamapada, the Buddha's path of wisdom, Mano Bubangama Tamma, Mano Setta, Mano Maya, meaning that all phenomena are preceded by the heart. The heart is the most suitable vessel for the Tamma. When the heart has the Tamma, then whatever we do, through body or speech, it will always be auspicious. But if the heart is corrupt, then whatever we do, we will always be consumed by dukkha. This dukkha is like the wheel of the cart that follows the track of the ox that pulls it. Dukkha will always follow those who do bad or evil deeds, while happiness will always follow those who do good deeds. One who has virtue in his heart is one who always carries with them the medicine to cure their illnesses. Wherever he goes, there is always some form of cure for him that will alleviate his affliction. Therefore, Tamma is not something insignificant, something that we can disregard. We should not think that the Sasana is something merely inscribed on palm leaves or found just in the monasteries, that the Sasana only belongs to the bhikkhus and samaneras, that it only belongs to the Lord Buddha and the Arahant disciples, that it only belongs to the Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha. All of this is just misunderstanding. Because the Tamma in truth is common property for anyone to use as they please, we can use it to quench the fire inside our hearts. Tamma is the natural and common property of the world. One who seeks virtue, righteousness, gracefulness, and coolness will not be off the mark if they take the Tamma as their compass and guide. Nothing can surpass the Tamma in wisdom. Where does Banya come from if not from the Magga, the Noble Eightfold Path? Sati is mindfulness, 
or constant awareness of the actions of our body, speech, and heart. This is the path, the magga. This is sammasati, right mindfulness. Our actions of speech and body that are right and proper are called sammavata and sammagamanda. They are the factors of the path, the tamma teaching of the Lord Buddha, which is perfect and flawless. We aren't good or bad simply because we are born human. Whatever class of people we belong to cannot be considered either good or bad. Truly, it depends on our conduct of body, speech, and heart, and whether these are conducted in the right or wrong way, the good or bad way. We can only be judged by our actions. Simply being born as a human being doesn't mean that we are good. The only thing good about it is that it is the result of our past actions, and that is a good result. But as far as the good of the future and present is concerned, this depends on our conduct and the training of ourselves following the right and proper way of the Tamma teaching of the Lord Buddha that can make us grow in a good way gradually until reaching the highest virtue. The Tamma cannot be blamed for not making us good, for it is us who have to develop ourselves to be good. We aren't good and virtuous because we don't develop ourselves with the Lord Buddha's sublime tamma. How many sentient beings did the Lord Buddha lead out of the stream of samsara and transform them into supreme human beings, like the Arahants, the Anagamis, the Sakadagamis, and the Sotapannas, who have all purified themselves with the tamma of the Lord Buddha to the utmost of their ability. This is the way that people can be good through the way of tamma. Without the tamma teaching, we cannot be good. Concerning those who have gone forth, these are the practitioners who have taken up the yellow robe and been ordained into the sasana following the tradition established by the Lord Buddha and the Arahant disciples. This yellow robe is dyed with the dye taken from the heartwood of the jackfruit tree, similar to how it was done in the past. This color is not desired by the world, but it is appropriate and suitable for the life of a bhikkhu. We have to realize that we have now taken up the yellow robe and been ordained in the sasana, but the Gelesas themselves have not taken up the yellow robe with us. The Gelesas are inside our hearts. How can we make ourselves good if we do not get rid of the Gelesas? The Gelesas are the evil ones and the enemies of the Tamma. Every kind of Gelesa, from the coarsest to the most subtle, is antagonistic to the Tamma. In order to remove them, we have to always fight them. Sometimes we have to put our lives at stake. If the Gelesas do not die, then we will. And if we do not die, then the Gilesas must die. First we should at least subdue the Gilesas, then in the end conquer them and totally annihilate them. This is for the purpose of making ourselves respectable. From the first day of our going forth, it is only ourselves that have gone forth. The Gilesas do not ordain with us. To go forth or be ordained means to abstain from the things that we should abstain from, and to develop the things that we should develop. We are the ones who have gone forth and we must take up the Tamma Vinaya as our guiding principle. This is especially true with the Vinaya, the monastic discipline, the tool to curb and suppress the coarser kinds of Gilesas, which can be clearly seen by all. The Vinaya will keep the Gilesas within the disciplinary bounds. It will restrain and suppress the Gilesas that manifest themselves through the actions of body and speech that are initiated by the heart, and the Tamma is used to correct the Gilesas inside the heart. Combating the Kilesas is similar to the way the world wages war. For instance, in a boxing ring, the boxers put their lives at stake when they get into the ring. They put their whole effort into the fight, and while they are fighting, they are not concerned with winning or losing, but only with exerting themselves to their fullest. If they have to lose their life, they are ready to give it up. This is an example for us practitioners to emulate. We must always consider every kind of Kilesas as our enemy. There are many aspects of Tamma. Tamma is a tool or instrument. It also supports and lifts us. Satipanya is the tool to combat the Gilesas. It will search and destroy Gilesas wherever they may be hidden. Satha, which is faith or conviction, serves as a source of encouragement or support. This is the belief that the Gilesas can be conquered, that we can defeat them. Virya is another form of support, making us strive with the most diligent of efforts. This is the way to develop ourselves to be good and virtuous. This is the way to make the bhikkhus and samarneras good bhikkhus and good samarneras according to the vinaya and the tamma. With the vinaya, they are graceful to behold in what they do and say. With the tamma, they are cool, peaceful, calm and graceful, having zatipanya to take care of their hearts. 
Every form of gilesa is harmful to us and must be eliminated. They must be removed or suppressed during every moment of our exertions. The results of our struggling with the gilesas in the manner of a follower of the Lord Buddha will be attained first at the morality level. Then we will move up to the Arya or enlightenment level, beginning with the Sotapanna to the Sagadagami to the Anagami and finally to the Arahant level. These will be the fruits of our exertions in suppressing and removing the gilesas, stage by stage, according to our ability. These four levels of enlightenment, five including the morality level, are not beyond our ability and efforts if we use the vinaya and the tamma as our weapons to suppress and eradicate all of the gilesas inside our hearts. No time and place is as important as the place where the Aryazatta, the Four Noble Truths, are found. These four truths are Dukkha, Samudaya, Nirota, and Magga. And where is Dukkha found? It is found in the body and the heart. And where is Samudaya found? It is found in the heart. The cause of bodily illness is not considered Samudaya because it is not induced by the Gilesas. There are things that will cause the body to become sick, but they are not as dangerous as the Gilesas or Samudaya, the heart's greatest adversaries. That is why the Lord Buddha has to expose the nature of Samudaya, so that we can see it clearly for what it is. It is Gama Tarnha, Pawa Tarnha, and Vipawa Tarnha. The Lord Buddha said this in the Tamma Chakka Bhavatana Sutta, the first discourse. Gama Tarnha is craving for sensuality. It is a form of Gilesa, as far as Pawa Tarnha, craving for becoming, and Vipawa Tarnha, craving for not becoming, are concerned. We already know what they are, so I shall not discuss them in detail. I will instead discuss with you the root of the Four Noble Truths. Where are these Four Noble Truths? Where can they be found? Dukkha is in the heart. This is the most important fact. This Dukkha is caused by Samudaya. Samudaya is its source. Nirotha, the cessation of Dukkha. Where will this happen? Wherever Dukkha arises, that is where Nirotha, the cessation of Dukkha, will appear. What gives rise to Nirotha? What gives rise to the cessation of Dukkha? It is Magga, the path, the Madhima Berdibada, the middle way of practice. There are eight factors in this path, beginning with Samma Dirke and Samma Sankapo, right view and right thought. These are the two factors of Banya or wisdom. In doing any task, we usually choose a person who is wise for our leader. If we have an ignorant person as leader, then they will usually lead our undertaking to failure. Nobody will trust such a person. Both Samma Dirte and Samma Zangabbo, right view and right thought, highlight the wisdom of the Magga, the path. And where can this Magga be found? This Magga is one form of Jaya Tamma, mental concomitant, and similarly with Samudaya, the cause of Dukkha. This Samudaya arises from Sanya, Sankara, and Vinyarna. Where else can Samudaya come from? When they cause the Gilesas to arise, this is called Samudaya, and when they cause the suppression and removal of the Dukkha and Gilesas, this is called the Magga. Thinking in the way of truth and insight, this is called Banya. Constant awareness is called Sati or mindfulness. Sati is Magga, and it arises from the heart. It is the same way with the Gilesas, which also arise from the heart. But the Gilesas oppress the heart and wear it down. They control and subjugate the heart, and subject it to a lot of affliction and hardship. They constantly place pressure on the heart. Magga is the cleansing agent that is used to clean all of these gilesas, so that the heart can elevate itself to the highest level, the state of freedom. Nirotha, the cessation of Dukkha, will steadily come about following the strength of the Magga. When the time comes for the heart to achieve the final and total cessation of Dukkha due to the strength and ability of the fully developed Magga, then this will happen in a single instant. This is when the Arahatta Magga, or the path of Arahantship, instantly extinguishes all the Gilesas, Tanha, and Asava that converge and hide behind Avidza. Nirotha, the cessation of Dukkha, will be the outcome. When the Magga has totally extinguished the Gilesas, the Nirotha will come to fruition. When Nirotha, which is the result of Magga, emerges, then the task of extinguishing Dukkha also comes to an end right within that instant. 
That is why the Lord Buddha said that Dukkha should be observed, so that we can see it clearly, although we already know it within ourselves, since we are not dead. How can we not know it? But the reason why the Lord Buddha told us to study Dukkha is that although we all have Dukkha, we never look at it and analyze its nature so that we can know how to overcome and get rid of it. For this reason, the Lord Buddha taught his followers a systematic way of investigating Dukkha. The Lord Buddha said that we should study Dukkha and relinquish Samudaya, its cause. And how are we going to let go of Samudaya? Here the Lord Buddha said it very briefly, but the meaning itself is extensive. In order to let go of Samudaya, we have to make diligent efforts, with Satipanya leading the investigation. No matter how hard this may be, we have to commit ourselves to the task. This is the way of relinquishing Samudaya. This is the way of getting rid of all the Samudaya or Kilesas from the heart by the application of the Magga, the Madhima Badibada, the middle way of practice. Nirotha, the cessation of Dukkha, will appear as a consequence. That is to say, Dukkha will disappear. These Four Noble Truths do not happen separately. The way they are being discussed, it seems that they happen one by one, but really they all happen together. When Dukkha arises within the heart, the awareness that it has done so also arises at the same instant. The investigation into the cause of Dukkha that afflicts and disturbs the heart also arises at the same time. Speaking of the disturbances of the heart, these are the aramana or mental objects or emotions that the heart has become attached to. For instance, when someone speaks badly of us, if we don't think about it, nothing will happen to our hearts, but when we think about it, we will become angry. This anger is called samudaya. When there is anger, how can there not be dukkha? It is this anger and ill will that cause dukkha, because we take the criticism seriously. This is samudaya that causes dukkha to appear. How can one extinguish this dukkha? When we ask this question, we are implementing the magga. This is when Satipanya begins to investigate the deception of Sankara. Before, when nobody tells us of other people's criticisms of us, we are not aroused by anger. But when somebody tells us of this criticism that may have been made some time ago, we become angry and afflicted with dukkha. This is one form of Samudaya. We are speaking of just one form of Samudaya, anger. But there is also another side of Samudaya, affection, like Gama Tanha or craving for sensuality, for instance. They are Samudaya or Kilesas, and similarly with dissatisfaction, they cause ill will and anger. Now we are investigating Sankara, which creates all the deceptions. Sankara is the deceiver, and so is Sanya, with which we assume and presume. Satibanya, or mindfulness and wisdom, must round up all the deceptions, bring them inside, subdue them, and finally eliminate them. Satibanya must prize Sankara and Sanya away from thinking about these angers and affections and calm them down. This is the way of curbing and eliminating the Gilesas. Once these Gilesas have been curbed and eliminated, for instance, when thinking about the criticism of us has been restrained, then the Dukkha will disappear. This is because both Sanya and Sankara are mesmerized by these deceptions. When Satipanya realizes this, then they will stop, and Dukkha will then vanish. When Sanya and Sankara, which are Kantas, have been subdued by Satipanya, then Dukkha will disappear, and Nirodha will appear simultaneously. Don't waste your time speculating about the world and the universe. It is a heavy load to shoulder and doesn't do you any good, such as when you imagine about the Magga, Pala and Nibbana. This is just a waste of time. You should instead investigate, identify, and remove the Gilesas from your hearts. Otherwise, the Gilesas will always remain inside your hearts to endlessly consume and afflict you all the time. All the Dukkha arises in the heart. Samudaya is like an endlessly long string and the source of Dukkha. If you don't cut this string with your Satipanya, you'll never find any moral excellence and happiness from your going forth. As I have said earlier, when we take up the robe, 
The Kilesas do not take up the robe with us. We have to fight the Kilesas, but most of the time we surrender. There are not many practitioners who are capable of conquering the Gilesas and attaining the highest fruit of Arahantship. We have to face this fact and consider it many, many times. There is a great difference between the time of the Lord Buddha and our time as far as going forth or ordination is concerned. Nowadays, people ordain more as a ritual, which is in great contrast to the days of the Lord Buddha, when people went forth for the Tamma, they went forth with a perception of the harm of the things that they had experienced as laymen. They had experienced so much that they reached the point where they became sick and tired of it. So when they took up the robe, they took it up with sadha, firm conviction, and the desire to be free from dukkha and all the oppressive influences. Therefore, there is great contrast between the Arahant disciples during the time of the Lord Buddha the way they exerted themselves, and the way the bhikkhus exert themselves nowadays. During that time, the teacher who taught the Tamma was the Lord Buddha himself. Listening to the Tamma of the Lord Buddha is like receiving 100% pure gold. What the Lord Buddha taught was the real and genuine truth. The Tamma that the Lord Buddha attained was experienced by himself, and it was in accordance with the truth. He realized and experienced everything before teaching the Savakas. It was not necessary for the listeners to decide what was right and what was wrong. All they had to do was just to absorb the teachings. After they had listened to the Tamma instruction, they then went away to exert themselves to their utmost ability with diligence and conviction in their practice. In every mode of exertion, their hearts were filled with Tanda, Virya, Jitta, and Vimangsa. Satisfaction, diligent effort, concentration, and reflection. These four tammas blended into one. How then could the result that followed not have emerged? And so it happened that some of them attained enlightenment on that mountain, in that forest, on that walking path, in that sitting position, standing up or lying down. They attained enlightenment because they had earnestly committed themselves to their practice. Both the tamma teaching and the teacher, the Lord Buddha himself, were both real and not dubious. Those who listened to the Tamma had perceived the danger of living in the world of Sangsara, so their hearts were ready vessels for the Tamma. So when the Lord Buddha taught the Tamma to them, they were able to fully absorb it, and they applied it in their practice until they attained the highest goal. They then became the Sangha refuge, Sangkang Saranangatami. This was the way that people took up the robe in the time of the Lord Buddha. You must not think that the Tamma of this time and that time are different, or the Gilesas of this time and that time are two different kinds of Gilesas. Truly, the Gilesas of that time and the Gilesas of this time are one and the same thing, and it is the same with the Tamma. The Tamma of the past and the Tamma of the present are the same Tamma. The differences are only in the teaching techniques and the ability of the teachers. The important thing is to find a teacher who truly knows the Tamma, faithfully teaches the Tamma, and has attained the highest level of enlightenment, like the Arahant disciples of the past. You should study with that teacher. They will give you the full benefit of the Tamma teaching. You will not have to doubt their teaching, because what they teach will be the true and genuine Tamma. Where then can the paths and fruits be when you are ready for them? So as far as seeking a teacher is concerned, you should look for the best teacher, one who has attained the highest state of purity, the state of buddha or enlightenment. So when you practice to the utmost of your ability and with unshakable faith in the Tamma, then the result cannot be different from the Zalakas. They must be the same. People nowadays take up robes as a ritual, but those who took up robes in the past really had the purpose of getting rid of their sensual lust, their gamaraga. Some of them had grown weary of this lust even before they took up the robe, whilst others grew weary of it afterwards. Some of them even took up the robe without intending to remain so, but due to their underlying tendencies, their upanisaya, they eventually came to appreciate the tamma, took up the practice, and finally attained the magga, pala, and nibbana. In short, they took up the robe to give up their sensual lust or out of weariness of it, and they really practiced to attain freedom. 
Nowadays, most people take up the robe as a mere ritual just to accumulate the gelezes and sensual lust. For instance, the lust for wealth and status can stir up the sensual lust within our hearts. Some are driven to insanity by their cravings. If a bhikkhu takes up the robe for these reasons, can you say that he takes up the robe to get rid of dukkha, rather than just accumulating gelezes and causing disgust among the laity? People can easily get tired of this kind of bhikkhu because they take up the robe just to accumulate more lust. What is the use of doing this? It is useless. Think about it. I am not exaggerating, for this is the truth. We can all see it. But if you take up the robe following the example of the Lord Buddha and the Savakas, then can the highest goal really escape from your practice? Your practice is really vital, so please take it to heart. Every kind of lust is the product of the Gilesas. You must always look at them as harmful to the heart, and always fight them. The word pra in Thai means bhikkhu. It also means noble. Don't be noble just in name, like a person with a noble name but who finds himself in jail. Let us be noble in quality. As a practitioner, you must not be heedless or complacent. In your conversations, don't get carried away, for this is a way of being heedless and negligent, and is contrary to the tradition of the bhikkhu and practitioner. You must always be mindful and cautious. Be very mindful in your conversations when you come together to work or have your refreshment. Watch your heart. As far as having refreshment is concerned, this is merely to keep your body going. But as far as the conflict between the Kilesas and the Tamma is concerned, you must always keep on fighting. If you ever want to acquire the most supreme and valuable treasure, it's essential that you must always watch out for Sankara and Sanya. As a practitioner, you must beware the chicanery of these two most significant Kandhas. As far as the eyes and visible form, the ears and sound, etc. are concerned, they are not as incessant as the sunya and sankara that are always mesmerized by the thoughts that arise from the gelesas, danha, and asava that in turn entangle your heart. They continually exhibit themselves. Even when you're doing walking meditation, they draw up images of the gelesas right in front of you. Sanya recalls the past. It remembers past experiences of visible objects, sounds, tastes, smells, and tactile objects, and the accompanying emotions that disturb the heart. It is sanya and sankara that create the various feelings and emotions inside the heart. Even while you're doing walking meditation, you can be creating the kilesas right there and then. This is because you are continually being deceived by sanya and sankara both day and night. As soon as you wake up, they begin to create the images of the Kilesas. But you don't know this. Whatever topics Sanya recalls and Sankara thinks of, restlessness, agitation, and dissatisfaction will follow, because they will only recall and think of issues that poison the heart. So, how can the heart not be upset? If you are observant, you will know this. As a practitioner, how can you not know this? You will get to see very clearly how important sanya and sankara are. They are constantly creating feelings and emotions to disturb you. As a practitioner, you must be earnest and serious in your practice. Totally commit yourself. I would really like to listen to my students telling me about the results that arise from their practice. My students, who have come to live with me and receive my instructions that I have given them to the utmost of my ability, I have not hidden anything or kept anything secret from you concerning the various aspects and levels of the Tamma. In every aspect of the Tamma, be it the practice itself or the results from it, I have completely revealed it to you without hiding anything. What happened to this Tamma that I have taught you? Has it become void without any result? Is this the reason why you cannot practice and attain the result that I have explained to you? This is really something worth thinking about. The heart of the practitioner must be strong and resolute. Don't be weak and wavering. This is not good because it is contrary to the Tamma principles. Weakness is not good for you. When you defy the Tamma principles, you do it vigorously. But when you follow the Tamma principles, you do it feebly. As far as Samati and Banya are concerned, you must not wait for them. Whenever it is appropriate to use Banya, you must use it. Banya kills the Gilesas. 
Samati subdues them. They work together in subduing and destroying the Gelesas. Banya is terribly important. When you are investigating with Banya and it suddenly strays into speculative thoughts and away from the truth, then you must first get back into Samati to subdue the restless Gelesas. You should use a meditation object that suits you to calm your heart. If you use the in and out breath as your meditation object, then you should be solely mindful of your in and out breath and ignore everything else. Don't let anything distract you from your concentration. The heart likes to think a lot. The chief culprits here are the Gelesas that push Sankara to think and Sanya to speculate. They are a lot more restless than monkeys, making the heart behave like a monkey. For example, when you investigate the body with Banya, but you can't see the asulpa or loathsomeness of the body, or anitang, dukkang, and anatta of the body, then it's because the Gelesas have taken over. The heart is now hungry for other thoughts, so you must immediately curb it by using samadhi. Be earnest. Really commit yourselves. After the heart has gained calm, then you should investigate again. You must astutely direct your investigation if you want it to be fruitful. Then you are really investigating with banya. This is only possible when the heart is calm. You must always observe your investigation. When you practice mental development, you cannot avoid observing. You have to observe. You cannot rely solely on the techniques taught by your teacher. You have to also devise your own techniques, otherwise you will not gain any wisdom. Any time when it is suitable to investigate, then you must investigate. You can investigate the anitsang, dukkang, and anatta of the body, or you can investigate the loathsomeness of the body, or any other way you like that accords with the truth and causes dispassion of the body to arise. They are the truth, but when the heart's view goes contrary to the tamma, then it is not willing to accept this truth. What is your body like? Where does it come from? You must dig into it and differentiate it to see its true nature. You say that it is I, or you, or they, or them, or that it is people, or an animal. Where does this body get its form? You must dig into its origins, which are the four elements of earth, water, air, and fire. The body is mostly composed with the earth element, namely hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, sinews, bones, so forth. You can see them clearly with your own eyes. They are the earth element. Saliva, for instance, is the water element. The air element is the air we breathe in. The fire element is the heat that digests your food. These are the four elements, but when the heart takes possession of this body, it then erroneously perceives it to be I or they or people or animals. This body is I and it is mine. The eyes, the arms, the legs, and all the other body parts are all mine. Your heart generates these perceptions automatically. The same with animals. They don't have to be told because it's nature's way. The Gelesas are one aspect of nature. They do not need to be taught. These four elements combine to become the body and then become possessed by the heart. How long will they remain combined? From the time of conception? Maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years or more. From time immemorial, you have been deceived by the Gelesis to think that the body is I, is a human being, is an animal, is you, or is me, although it is just the formation of the four elements of earth, water, air, and fire. But the Gelesis deceive you to think otherwise. When the body dies, where does it go? Do you still call it a human being or an animal? The earth element will return to earth. The water element will return to water, the air element will return to air, and the fire element will return to fire. They all return to their respective element. Can you still call this body a human being or an animal? Of course not. They are just elements, and truly so. But when they combine to form the body, why do you then give them a different name, although they are still the elements? You must investigate the truth with Banya. It is only the heart that can make this body move around. This body is just the elements. When it dies, it just returns to the elements. But you keep calling it I or mine from the day of your birth to the present. You have been deceived by the Kilesas. Do you still want to be deceived by them? You will be deceived by them until you die if you don't see its true nature. 
If your banya cannot catch up with the kilesas, then you will always think in terms of I and mine and of animals and human beings. Even after the body has gone back to its respective elements, the upadana or attachment to this view will always remain embedded within your heart. When it takes up a new body, it will consider the body to be I and mine again. This will go on forever without ever coming to an end. This is the way to investigate with banya. In order to clearly see the truth, you must investigate again and again until it is permanently impressed within your heart. Your attachment will disappear naturally when you have really seen the truth. You can't force the attachment to disappear. Only Banya can do this. When Banya has seen the truth, then the attachment will disappear. Whichever part of the truth you've seen, then that part will be free. That is why you are taught to investigate, because once you have investigated and come to understand the truth, then you will let go of them, because they are all fake. They are not the truth. You are defying the truth, and are constantly living with false truth in all of your postures, standing, sitting, walking, and lying down, both day and night. You don't know this, so you must investigate. Speaking about particula, or the filthiness of the body, it is full of excrement. This excrement comes out through the hair of the head, the nails, the teeth, or the pores of the body. They're all over the body. There is nothing there that you can call pretty or beautiful. This body is merely wrapped with a very thin skin membrane. Is it really impossible for Satyan Banya to penetrate this thin membrane if you really want to? What is the purpose of Satibanya? It is for digging out the truth, especially that of the five kandhas or aggregates. You cannot eat panya. It's only used for the investigation of the various parts of the body that the master of deception has taken hold of. When you have seen it clearly, then the ubadana or attachment will vanish. This ubadana is much heavier than a solid mountain. When you have seen clearly, you will let go of your attachment and the heart will become loftier. It will continue to elevate until it finally arrives at the state of freedom or purity. Be earnest. Really commit yourselves to your practice. You have to have standards and goals. Don't be lackadaisical. Don't see other places as more important than the place where you'll find the truth. This should be your main criterion. Wherever you are, you should think of this criterion. It's your battleground. It's where the Gelezas are found. The Lord Buddha taught the Tamma clearly. His teaching was well taught in every respect, capable of leading the practitioner gradually away from Dukkha, eventually achieving the complete freedom from Dukkha without any doubts. So, how can you have any doubts? The Gilesas do not have a teacher, so how is it that they can become your teacher? The Lord but tirelessly taught us the Tamma. How then can the Tamma not prevail over the Gilesas? Your practice can conquer the Gilesas. The Gilesas have no teacher, but you have a teacher who has taught you very well. Why can't you then beat the Gilesas, which have not been to school at all? You have always been on the losing side. This is no good. Normally, in the beginning, you have to struggle very hard. This is because the Gilesas have always been very powerful. They have always dominated your heart. So when you subdue them, you must use maximum effort, sometimes even putting your life at stake. When it is time to give up your life for the noble truth, then you must do it. Make the results appear and the light shine forth in your heart. When you see the truth that really impresses your heart, then you cannot help but utter, Fantastic! Now I know the truth of Dukkha, the truth of Samudaya, and the truth of attachment. They cannot escape from Banya. Be serious and earnest. Teachers that can really teach the Tamma are very hard to find nowadays. There are many practicing bhikkhus, but very few of them have discovered or come across the noble truth from their practical experience. And what is the reason? It is degeneration. Although a banknote is merely a piece of paper, it is enough to burn a bhikkhu's heart. We all know that it is just a piece of paper. If you use it to roll a cigarette, it doesn't even taste good. But you are deluded by it. The heart will readily grab the fake things because it itself is full of fake things. So when two phony things come together, it is very easy for them to combine because there is no truth in the heart. 
But when you have developed your heart through your practice and have stage by stage established the noble truth inside your heart, you'll then discard the fake things and the heart will change from being phony to being genuine. In the beginning, the practice is very hard, but you have to endure it. You have endured Dukkha for aeons in the past. In this life, the Dukkha is also pervasive. When the heart constantly builds up worries and anxieties, how can you avoid Dukkha? These Khandhas are the tool of the Kilesas, and they enable the Kilesas to constantly exhibit themselves. As soon as Kilesas appear, Dukkha also simultaneously appears. So, how can you not experience Dukkha? If you can't see the danger of the Gilesas, you'll never see the Thamma. I have instructed you to the utmost of my ability, and really want you to practice. I don't want to see zero results. When doing walking or sitting meditation, there is just sleepiness. How then can there be any result? So, what are you going to do? Today it is like this. Tomorrow you'll do the same thing and get the same result. No new result to surprise the heart. You'll then become discouraged. The teaching that your teacher has given you will be meaningless because the Kilesas win. They make no exception for any class of people. They dominate and influence your heart and make you suffer. You have taken up the robe for the purpose of eliminating the Kilesas through your own diligent efforts and strenuous exertions. Why can't you do it? When you have eliminated some of the Kilesas, you'll see the benefits of your efforts. When the heart has calmed down from the restlessness and agitation from your meditation practice, you'll see how valuable your practice is. You'll then move forward. If you keep using Satipanya, it will mature. When you investigate the body and the other Kanthas, the truth will gradually appear. Banya will arise from your investigation. When you have seen the benefits of Banya, you'll want to investigate more and more until Banya becomes automatic. As the Gilesas steadily diminish, your diligent effort will steadily increase until reaching full capacity. Then you'll always want to go into battle. To fight the Gilesas will be your main preoccupation. Your laziness will disappear because it is the product of the Gilesas. The more the Gilesas diminish, the more intense will be your conviction and efforts. The more the Gilesas disappear, the more the Thamma will appear. When all the Gilesas are totally eliminated, you'll then see that all the Dukkha that used to consume your heart have all disappeared. The heart then becomes totally empty. Nothing can disturb or afflict it any more, because you have totally relinquished your attachment with Banya. When Banya has investigated to the point of clearly seeing the noble truth, it will let go of everything. Then the heart becomes empty, devoid of the Kilesas, Danha, and Asava that used to poison the heart in the past. This emptiness is the absolute Thamma. All that is left behind are the Kanthas that still remain functional, just like the lizard's tail that still wriggles and wriggles after it has been cut off the creature's body. These Kanthas will remain functional until death when they finally cease. They are insignificant and don't know that they are so. For instance, the body doesn't know that it is a body, neither do Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, or Vinyarna. They appear and then disappear. Sanya recollects, then disappears. Vinyarna becomes aware of the sense objects and then disappears, because Avidda, the main culprit, is no longer there to direct them. The Kanthas then become the instrument of the Thamma, before they were the instrument of the Kedesas. But after the emptiness or absolute Thamma has appeared in the heart, then the Kanthas are used to benefit the world, like the Lord Buddha and the Zavakas who used the five Kanthas to teach the Thamma to the world. When all the Gilesas have been eliminated, then all the Kanthas will become the instrument of the Thamma until death following the law of Anitsang, Dukkang, and Anatta. They are Samudhi, or conventional reality, and must follow the law of Samudhi. The Kanthas are Samudhi, so are Anitsang, Dukkang, and Anatta. They must go their natural way. The one who has attained purity doesn't have any problems. He is free from worry. Nibbanang Brahmang Sulkhang. Nibbana is the supreme bliss. Where do you find it? When the Kailasas have all disappeared from the heart, that's where you'll find it.
What else are you going to seek? You have always been afflicted with Dukkha because of the Kilesas, but after the Kilesas have all disappeared, where are you going to find any Dukkha? And where are you going to look for Nibbana? If you're still deluded, you will still seek it, but after you have become enlightened, you won't look for it any more. Nibbana Barabang Sukhang is eternal. The Lord Buddha said that Nibbana is permanent. When the heart has attained absolute contentment and has let go of all samuti, it won't be upset by any problems because it is totally devoid of them. What problems can there be? Living or dying poses no problem because they are part of nature. This heart hath transcended all the problems of the world. <laughs>